The 19th century was a period of great scientific discovery. Spurred by the Industrial Revolution, massive advancements in geology, paleontology, botany, and engineering were made. Science was no longer the domain of learned men in elite universities. Cheap books made it accessible to the general public, and a paradigm shift occurred among the working class trades, including railroading. Suddenly, railroaders engaged in a feverish application of science to every aspect of the industry to create a hypothetical ideal railroad. Locomotive builders like Baldwin, as well as many railroads, established their own scientific laboratories to produce quantifiable data to back up their claims of quality and reliability. Naturally, of course, in the rigors of science, bad ideas emerged as well. Some were frauds, many were well-intentioned but impractical. Quite a few actually made sense, but overcomplicated the solution that they offered, instead of fixing the problem they were supposed to answer. This is a Greer Spike. Never in the history of the world has a simple metal fastener accumulated so much myth. If you like Colorado narrow gauge, you might know it as a Jeffrey Spike. Tall tales about its invention and use have pervaded its history. In reality, the story of the Greer Spike is rather simple, but is an example of 19th century scientific enthusiasm within railroading. One of the largest concerns on the minds of railroad executives and the laboratories they employed to perform these experiments was rail spread, which was one of the most common forms of track failure outside of a broken rail. Rail spread is the widening of the gauge. It can be caused by lateral forces of a train moving through a curve, from heat expansion or cold shrinkage, loosening of the spikes, erosion of the subroad bed, and rotting of the ties. Intense scrutiny was placed on the spikes to develop a design that would hold into the tie without loosening or bending. The Greer spike was the invention of Howard Greer of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. He joined Morris Sellers, a former master mechanic of the CNNW, to market his product. Sellers himself invented a fish plate that he called the Sampson Splice Bar. Greer's development started as a machine that produced spikes cut from bar stock. In 1883, he patented the distinctive profile of his spike, which entered the commercial market in 1891. The manufacturing process of the Greer spike fit perfectly with the Morris Sellers & Company rolling mill, and Greer and Sellers developed a completely automated manufacturing line to produce the spikes, with the only humans necessary being one person to feed the spikes from the rolling mill into grinding belts and the other to pack the spikes into kegs. Hot steel was rolled through forms to produce long bars in the shape of the spike. These bars were then sliced into the correct width, then each individual spike was annealed in a furnace. Once annealed, the spikes were fed into a continuous belt that ran them through sharpening wheels to give a point a chisel edge. A reporter for the National Car and Locomotive Builder magazine called this edge sharp enough to pare one's nails. The chisel edge was the real selling point of the Greer spike. Normal spikes tended to crush the wood fiber of the tie. The Greer spike sliced straight into the tie. This, according to Morris Sellers and Company advertising, resulted in greater holding power, allowing the spike to remain tightly in the tie without moving or loosening for a longer period. As was the spirit of the period, the Greer spike immediately underwent rigorous scientific testing by various organizations. Morris Sellers and Company performed their own tests, but so did the Chicago Northwestern, and Thomas Nash of the Sheffield Testing Works in England, who compared it with English track fasteners. Various wood types were used for the ties, varying from cedar to oak to ash and Baltic pine. Greer spikes and standard spikes were driven into the ties and then pulled, measuring the force required to move them. What all three laboratories found was that a Greer spike far exceeded any other spike's holding power, regardless of tie material, to the tune of 990 to 4,000 pounds above the competition depending on what wood was used. A second experiment tested lateral forces against the rail. A screw jack was applied first to the head, then to the web of the rail, and expanded to apply equal force to both rails in a section of track. The standard spikes tended to bend against the pressure of the web and pull out of the tie against the pressure of the head, while the Greer spikes stayed put. What modern viewers focus on, however, is not the part of the spike that was supposed to be important. The Greer spike profile has a distinctive double head appearance. The reason for the second head was to solve another problem common among the small standard spikes of the period. When driving the spike, the center of a standard head was not on the center of the shank. 
and whacking it with a spike maul tended to bend the head downwards as the spike entered the wood. This also drove many spikes crooked, requiring a few taps to the backside to bend the head into contact with the web of the rail. The second head on the Greer spike was located square on the center of the shank, directing the force of the spike maul directly down the middle. Contrary to a common myth, the second head had nothing to do with pulling the spike out, and it could be removed from a tie with a standard claw bar instead of a mythical specialized tool that is often believed to have existed. Based on these scientifically acquired numbers and the advertised advantages, it was no question that the Rio Grande Southern would look into trying out the new Greer spike when in 1892, the company began preparations to upgrade their main line from 30 pound rail to 57 pound rail. All railroad companies were in a frenzy of experimentation at the time. In Utah, William Palmer proudly advertised the use of cutting edge pressed steel Ajax rail braces on his recently standard gauged Rio Grande Western. The Rio Grande Southern was one of dozens of railroads that tried out the Greer Spike, among which included its neighbors, both the Denver and Rio Grande, and the standard gauge Colorado Midland. 675 kegs of the spikes were ordered for use between Vance Junction and Rico, Colorado. The Rio Grande Southern also used flanged tie plates, another recent development, which caused some difficulty as the flanges had to be pounded into the tie in order for the rail to seat properly. But the Rio Grande Southern's track employees didn't understand this. In regard to the spikes themselves, Superintendent Lee wrote on July 21st, 1893, Relative to the Greer track spike now in use on our 57 pound rail, the spike so far has given entire satisfaction. I am of the opinion that we will have no cause for complaint. The downfall of the Greer spike was not any deficiency or shortcoming in its design, but because the problems it solved were too niche to result in any long-term benefit. Railroads found that chemically treating their ties with creosote did far more to extend their working life than spikes themselves could, and the extreme holding power of the Greer spike made track maintenance difficult due to the amount of force required to pull them out when compared to a standard spike. Howard Greer also killed his invention through a series of disastrous business decisions. In 1895, he formed his own company, the Greer Spike Company, and split from Morris Sellers and Company. In 1901, he bought the Decker and Unrath Packing Company, a beef processor in Chicago, and reconstructed its packing plant to become his factory. The Greer Spike Company quickly descended into an inescapable debt, and the remainder of its existence was subject to lawsuits to recover what it owed. In 1906, only two employees were listed for the company and by 1910 it was sold at foreclosure auction. The buyers were uninterested in continuing the production of the spike as the railroad industry as a whole had found other solutions for the ailments that the Greer Spike claimed to cure. For some reason, the Greer Spike became known in Colorado as the Jeffrey Spike. It was never referred to as such in the Rio Grande Southern's records. In the national trade press, including track laying manuals, it was always referred to by its correct brand name. Early rail fan publications such as Josie Moore Crumb's 1961 The Rio Grande Southern and James M. Joyce's 1976 Railroad Spikes, a collector's guide, acknowledge the popular use of Jeffrey Spike, but admit that the only explanation they could come up with is that it might be named after Edward Turner Jeffrey, the president of the Denver and Rio Grande who was appointed as court-ordered receiver to the Rio Grande Southern during its 1893 bankruptcy. Legend claims that Jeffrey was unpopular among the Rio Grande Southern employees, so they attached his name to a spike that they supposedly despised in equal measure. While often repeated around the internet, there is no reliable source for this story. Jeffrey's spike is a misnomer with no real basis in fact, and it doesn't help that there actually was another Jeffrey spike that was patented in 1911, but it looks nothing like a career. <laughs>